Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday's seminar. And uh, this week we have one from Anna Marti on MT response function analysis. Uh, just to give you the lineup for the next few weeks, we have next week we have, whoa, that's going rather fast. We have Alireza Malamia talking about smart exploration. This is a, an EU program that uh, primarily seismology, but some EM and potential fields. Um, and the week after, Stefan Thiel, <clears throat> in the third of our series of national MT programs, giving us a talk on OSLAMP. Uh, and the week after, another Aussie, Alison Kirkby, talking about MTPI, uh, a user's guide. And then uh, first uh, seminar in March is uh, Doug Oldenburg, Fundamentals of Inversion. And I expect a lot of people to be interested to, in listening to Doug. And then the week after is Lindsay Higgy, who's uh, been working with Doug a long time. And she'll talk to us about how, basically how to capture Doug's brain <laughs> into code, <laughs> Simpeg and uh, GSI. A uh, week after that, we have a really exciting talk by uh, Costanza Manacero on uh, probabilistic inversion using uh, very fast 3D forward problems. Very, very fast 3D forward problems. And then the week after that is uh, Julian Hubert on space weather, GICs and MT. So excellent lineup for the next, uh, for this month and next month. Just to remind you, all of these uh, MNRs are, are being uh, saved and you can view any of them uh, by going to the link on uh, the MNR webpage and the presentation. And you can register for upcoming MNRs and I'm setting these up as, as people send me information. And then finally, just some housekeeping information. You're on a, a Zoom webinar. So you've got basically four things you can do as a, um, as, a, as an attendee, you can change your audio settings where your sound comes out of. You can send a message to the panelists if you want to alert us to something. You can raise your host, sorry, you can signal the host by raising your hand. And um, that's this raise hand function that you want to, perhaps towards the end, if you want to get into discussion with the speaker about something, you can raise your hand and we can make you uh, authorize your audio and even your video if you want. And then finally, there's a Q&A box um, and you can send in questions. Now, some of these, if you want to send them in on the fly, some of these may be clarifying in nature. Uh, and perhaps I'll just ask uh, Anna to, to explain something. Uh, some of these may be much more comprehensive and Anna will address them at the end. So today we, we have Anna, uh, Marty from uh, University of Barcelona, and I had her CV open, but I've closed it somehow when I started this webinar. So <laughs> I've known Anna a long time. She has uh, associate professor at uh, University of Barcelona, um, and I've sorry, you have to go to the CV, or perhaps Anna will introduce herself. So I'll, I'll stop the share now and invite Anna to share your screen. And uh, yeah, remember Is to- Is it fine? Oh, Can yeah, you hear you me? Can... Yeah. Can you see the mouse? <laughs> yeah, absolutely perfect, Anna. Okay, so, well, thank you, Alan. Um, yeah, just to uh, those who don't know me, I'm a yeah, associate professor at the University of Barcelona. I've been working uh, in basically in the magnetotelluric method for, for a few years now. And I've done some research on uh, crustal and lithospheric studies and on theoretical aspects related basic, especially to the dimensionality analysis and on the, um, the effects of the anisotropy in the, in the dimensionality. 
So yes, today I'll present this, this seminar on magnetotoluric response functions analysis. Uh, I guess you can see the, the mouse properly. If not, stop me. <laughs> No, so it's, the fine, it's fine. On okay, perfect. So the motivation of this uh, talk is, well, uh, it starts with the basic steps on the magnetotoric method, which are data acquisition. Then we do the time series processing, where we go from the time domain to the response functions in the frequency domain. Then we do uh, modeling and inversion and do the, the interpretation. But here there's a very important missing step, which is the analysis of the response functions. Why is this important? Well, it's very important to know the dimensionality of the structures before modeling and inverting the, the data. Uh, we might need to correct it from static shift, from distortion, and rotate to the proper uh, strike. And if it's possible, we want to identify if there are hints of anisotropy in our data. Ignoring this step could lead us to wrong models. Uh, for instance, Ledo et al. in these two papers explain the limitations of interpreting 3D data using uh, 2D modeling or uh, 2D inversion. And Minso Pustan Jones in 2011 explain the artifacts that can appear in our models if we interpret uh, anisotro anisotropic data as isotropic. Uh, we also might think that doing inversion, 3D inversion, might solve everything. So then we put empty data, we put it in the magic 3D inversion hat, but we can obtain unexpected uh, results in, the, in our models. So to avoid this, instead of that, what we'll do is to get as much information as we can from data analysis. And it can be used as constraints from our three models, like the if we have preferred orientations or if we know which uh, parts of our model can be more affected by distorting bodies. So in this seminar, I will focus on the analysis of the empty responses based on my experience. I want to explain the information about dimensionality and galvanic distortion that we can get from the impedance tensor and the tipper, describe the methods and tools to analyze it, and I'll focus basically on the wall invariance, the phase tensor, and the grumman bailey decomposition. And finally, uh, probably very briefly for lack of time, I will extend this analysis to anisotropic structures. The seminar then will be organized uh, in this way. First, I will exp um, a brief summary of how are the magnetotoluric responses and how we can uh, identify the dimensionality and distortion. Then I will explain the dimensionality analysis methods, then the decomposition methods, and as I say, I'll finish with the anisotropy. <laughs> So let's go to the first part. I'll first like a, a review. The magnetotoluic responses are obtained from the when after the we have our time series of electric and magnetic fields, we process them and we obtain the responses in the frequency domain. Um, we have the impedance tensor, which relates the electric the horizontal components of the electric field which the, with the um, horizontal components of the magnetic fields. And it's a tensor of four components, each of one is uh, complex. Uh, some authors use the magnetotelluric tensor instead, which we named M, which related, which uses the magnetic field B instead of H. From this impedance tensor, it's very common to work with the apparent resistivity and phase, which are compute uh, which can be computed for each component of the tensor. And again, uh, with, uh, it's, uh, for each frequency. And finally, we have the tipper vector, also with complex components, which relates the horizontal and the vertical components of the magnetic field. Um, for an isotro for a isotropic conductivity Earth, 
we can identify if we have a stratified uh, geoelectrical structure that the conductivity only changes in the in the in one direction. The impedance tensor has only two uh, of diagonal components, equal but with different sign, and the tipper vector has both components zero. If we have a 2D structure and we make our measures along the strike or parallel to it, the, the impedance tensor has two of the diagonal components, but this time they are, not, uh, they are in general different. These are the ones that we identified as the TE mode or the TM mode. And the T per vector has only one component, which is the one that is perpendicular to the uh, strike. Uh, and if we have a more general uh, earth conductivity that it changes in all directions, we have the general expression for both the impedance and the T per vector. However, if we have 2D cases that are not measures along the principal directions, the tensor has a, the general expression, uh, the T pair as well, but through the rotation matrix, we can recover a two-dimensional expression of the tensor. In this case, uh, well, I just show if the, we measure along the X and Y, but the structures are along the X prima direction, we doing a rotation, we can recover the 2D um, model or the, the 2D uh, tensor. Uh, another thing that can modify our tensors is the distortion. Distortion is caused by shallow and local bodies that are much more smaller than the target of interest. Uh, these bodies, the induction effects, because the, in magnetotulis we work with long with short frequencies, they decay rapidly and, are, and they can be in general ignored. But the galvanic effects can be very important. They, are, uh, they consist of accumulation of charges at the surface of these bodies, generating an anomalous field uh, E sub A. This, uh, this uh, as a consequence, what we measure is a sum of the regional electric field plus the anomalous field. But we can model it as uh, something that multiplies our regional electric field. And as a consequence, the relationship between the electric and the magnetic field is the impedance tensor, but multiplied by this C, which now I'm going to explain. This, matrix, this C is a matrix of real components and uh, Grumman Bailey described this as the product of these four uh, parts. Uh, G is a constant, the, the side gain, and twist, shear, and anisotropy are three matrices that contain the so-called parameters, the twist, shear, and anisotropy, which sometimes can also be um, understood as the tangent of three um, angles. For lack of time, I won't explain uh, all the details, but it's very instructive. Uh, in the original paper, each of these matrices has a graphical representation in which you can see how the twist uh, twists the electric field, the shear uh, provides a shear, and an isotropy also uh, modifies the, the field accordingly. So uh, in the different uh, uh, types of dimensionality, what will we measure if we have a distortion is the following. In 1D, the matrix C multiplies our tensor and the, because uh, all the components are, um, the two components are the same and have the same faces, all what happens is that each component becomes multiplied by a constant. I see a, um, the red and things of Zoom. I don't know if it's bothering everybody or just me. No, it looks fine to me. It's yeah. fine. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then if the regional structure is 2D, uh, in similar way, it multiplies the components, but then we'll have 
so sorry, eh? maybe I clear. In the first case, all the components will have the same faces. In 2D, the first column will have one face and the other a different face. Um, in both cases, we will call these types of uh, structures uh, 3D over 1D or 3D over 2D. And again, if we don't measure the, if we don't make our measurements along the strike direction, this will be uh, affected by uh, a rotation. In this, to the, in this uh, specific cases, as I said, the matrix C only affects the amplitudes, but not the phases. The phases remain the same. As a consequence, the gain and the anisotropy and under and they're undeterminable. And this is what we call the static shift. Also, if the 2D cases have equal phases in T and TM, the, then we cannot distinguish these two situations. If the distortion is affecting a, 3D, a 2D or a 1D a structure. Regarding the static shift, there are ways to correct it. And here I will name uh, a few. One, one can be from the data, empty data alone, like Le Total, that use the relations between the tipper and the uh, impedance tensor to correct it. We can also use additional information from the, for instance, uh, some more shallow method, that, uh, like the time domain electromagnetics, like per Pellerin and Hoffman or the paper of Pach et al, which is on geo, uh, geothermal study, which is uh, under revision. Also, static shift can be part of the inversion process included in the, in the structures that we model, like the inversion code of Abdeva et al, which also inverts for the full distortion. And finally, when it's 3D, the distortion uh, cannot uh, apparently be uh, differentiated from a general 3D case because it affects both the faces and, uh, and the amplitudes. So with all this information, what we can do is to look at the data and find the, the relationship between the components. We can plot it. And then we ask ourselves, is data is 1D, 2D, 3D, if it's distorted or not, what is the strike angle and if data might be uh, that we have uh, an isotropy in our electrical structure. This is not easy and not evident because as we showed the rotation and distortion modify our regional responses, the data errors affect the data. Then the geological, the real world is not exactly fitting our ideal 1D, 2D and 3D structures. And in general, all the measured tensors will look like this, all the components different than zero. But we can unveil the regional dimensionality by using uh, dimensionality and decomposition analysis methods. The first ones, dimensionality analysis, will tell us what is the type of dimensionality, what is the strike if we have 2D or 3D over 2D uh, cases, and if in this second case, try to find what are the distortion parameters. Whereas the composition methods, the, what they'll do is to assume a specific regional structure, identify and quantify if there is distortion, and retrieve the regional uh, tensor. So now I'm going to continue explaining the dimensionality analysis methods. I, I will define that the dimensionality analysis is based on the study of the relationship between the impedance tensor components and their derived parameters, which can be the rotational invariance of the tensor, which we will talk about uh, We'll talk a lot about them today. The tipper is not usually explicitly included in this, um, in this analysis, but it's crucial to solve ambiguities like the strike direction, to identify current concentrations, or to find hints for anisotropy. Uh, 
there are a lot of classification and a lot of methods, but as I say, I'm going to use uh, talk about the ones that I have more experience with, which are uh, one type based on the rotational invariance. And I will talk about the wall dim dimensionality analysis and those based on the analysis of the faces, which is the phase tensor. The rotational invariance of the imp impedance tensor are seven parameters, which are real. And uh, the full set can be uh, described in Sark and Menville in 1997. These uh, invariants are the trace, which is the sum of the, of the diagonal components of the tensor. And we have one invariant for the real part and one invariant for the imaginary part. Then there's the difference between of the non-diagonal components, one for the real part and one for the imaginary part. And then we have the determinant. From the determinant, we can we could find four um, for invariants, but only three of them are independent. So the most usual, usually the chosen ones are the determinant of the real part, the determinant of the imaginary part, and the imaginary part of the full determinant. From this, it's very common also to calculate the determinant resistivity and the phase the determinant, which can give us an average uh, of uh, how our uh, structures that we're measuring look like without making any assumption on the type of directionality or the dimensionality. So we have the measured tensor and we can characterize it instead of with its uh, components by these seven invariants and by one direction. So as I write here, eight components can be identified as seven invariants plus one directions. Different sets of invariants can be constructed from combinations of these seven ones and different um, dimensionality criteria can be established. In the literature, we can find uh, different sets of invariants and, invariants and strategies to determine the, the dimensionality and the strike angle. Um, I want name them all. I just um, underlined the ones that I worked uh, mostly. And regarding these ones, the ones from bar, um, there's one parameter that is the phase sensitive skew, which has been um, misused a lot because uh, some the, if its value is high, it implies 3D, but the other is not always true. So in this regard, um, well, I'll talk now a lot about the Weber et al. invariants, but there's also a paper that I published in 2005 in which I modified the, the bar parameters to make them compatible with uh, the Weber ones. But again, for lack of time, I cannot go in more detail of all these uh, comparisons. So the wall invariants from the paper of Weber Agar, Wall, and Lily in 2000, uh, in 2000 works with the magnetotoleric tensor, again, which is the relation between the, when it uses the magnetic, the B field instead of the H field. And the invariants are the two first ones will be like the equivalent to the determinant. They allow to obtain an average of the apparent resistivity and the phase. Then there are the invariants from three, to seven, which are dimen dimensionless and normalized. And the practicality of them is that their vanishing corresponds to a particular property of the tensor. There's also, there is also the Q uh, invariant, which is dependent on the others, is the, um, the de denominator <laughs> of I7. And if its value is very small, it means that I7 is meaning, meaningless. So from that, we can define seven types of uh, dimensionalities, but for simplicity, we can summarize them as, if all the invariants are zero, 
we have a 1D a structure. If only I3 and I4 or one of both are different than zero, we have a 2D a structure. Then there are different, different combinations between I5 to I7 and Q allowed to determine different types of distortion. And finally, if I7 is different than zero, we have a 3D structure. From this, uh, from this uh, criteria, then we can also determine if it's 1D, we will get the average uh, res apparent resistivity and phase. If it's 2D, we can calculate the strike, which should be the same value obtained from the real or from the imaginary part, and I call them theta 1 and theta 2. And if it's 3D over 2D, we can define the strike uh, 3. I call it 3 because it's calculated in a different way than in the 2D case. And we can obtain the twist and the shear angles. Now I will show you a synthetic example, which is from the original paper of Weber et al. It consists, here you have the plan view of the model and the, a cross section. It's a vertical contact that separates a homogeneous space from a stratified uh, model. And it has a local uh, shallow structure, which is very conductive. And now we'll calculate the invariance for sites and different, uh, different sites and periods located at different positions. For site one, this site is located very far from this contact. And sorry, I also forgot to say that all the measurements to make it a bit more exciting are done 40 degrees with respect to this main uh, contact. So for site one at 100 seconds, it doesn't see the contact, it only sees the the stratified structure, hence the, the impedance tensor are, uh, the, of diagonal components are much, much larger than the uh, of diagonals, which are practically uh, null. The invariants are all six, uh, all of them are zero, and we can obtain an average apparent resistivity of 29.5, which is like the something in between the, these two values, and a phase of 28 degrees. And uh, so the, it's a 1D a structure. For site two, this one is a bit closer to the contact. So in this case, I3 and I4 are not zero anymore, the rest are zero. And we can calculate the strike direction, which gives us a direction of 40 degrees, which is consistent with where the, how the measures were made. So we are in a 2D case. Then if we move to site three, which is next to the local conductor, we have at short, but at 100 seconds, uh, up to the invariant six is different than zero. So we obtain that this is a, a 3D over 2D structure with a 40 degree strike and a twist and shear of the, with these, these uh, values. But at 1000 seconds, what happens is that the T and the TM mode have the same faces. And then it is not distinguishable from if the distor there's distortion caused by this body, but we cannot distinguish if it's uh, over a 1D or a 2D regional structure. And finally, site four, which is located just above this uh, structure, and measure at one second, it gives us a general uh, 3D structure with because the invariant I7 is different than zero. What happened, however, in real data? The impedance, in the data from the impedance have errors and they propagate to the invariants. Also, already say the geological structures do not exactly fit our ideal models. 
So what will happen is that the invariants never vanish. So it's important to do an error estimation of the invariants and all the related parameters. And here there's an example of different invariants with different error bars. In this case, it's clear that this is above the threshold, the, is different than zero. And uh, in these cases, they will be below. So about, I should have started from here. We have to define a threshold value because it's, uh, as I say, the invariants never, never will vanish otherwise. If this threshold is too low, I put the, the bar here, all the invariants will tend to be uh, higher than that and everything will tend to be a 3D. If it's too high, the contrary will occur. All the invariants will be considered to be below that threshold and everything will be 1D. So we have to choose the value of this threshold value in a way that the dimensionality is consistent with the determination of the strike and the distortion angles. For instance, if we have a 2D case, the two strike directions obtained from the real and the imaginary part of the tensor um, should be approximately the same with the small errors. As we see in this graph, is the determination of the strike from the real and imaginary part. Only at low periods, we can consider that they have approximately or similar values with a small errors, where for higher periods, they are uh, much more different and with higher errors. Doing an extensive investigation on that, I, well, uh, I determined that thresholds between, between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 can be valid for data up to 30% of errors. Uh, so with this, um, I created the, well, me and my colleagues, the Waldim code, um, which is in this paper, which calculates the analysis of dimensionality from raw or from synthetic data using uh, the wall criteria and considering the errors. The Waldim is a, I put a, this open box because it's the open code and available for those who want to use it. The inputs are the impedances and their errors. And the outputs are the dimensionality, the strike direction, the distortion, if there is distortion parameters and makes an estimation of the errors. And the options is that we can use the real errors or add synthetic noise we can choose the threshold value and we can average the results in period bands. Here I will show you now an example of um, with uh, one site from this uh, diabetics data set, which is in the south of Spain, in which we did extensive study of the uh, crustal and lithospheric uh, geoelectrical structure. And specifically, I will show you these examples I've been B23, which we obtain the resistivities and phases. And next, I am plotting the invariant values. Uh, I3 and I4, which is, they are almost all, uh, sorry, and following this recommendation, I use a threshold of 0 0.15. I3 and I4 are basically always above the threshold. I5 and I6 are low for short periods, but increase as we go to longer periods. And I7 and Q, um, I7 first is large, but because Q is very small, it's like uh, if either one of these is zero, it's like zero <laughs> for both. But again, it, it, I7 increases with the period. So using the Waldim criteria, we could establish that at short periods, the structures is uh, R2D. Here at middle periods, there's a mix of 3D over 2D and 3D cases. And for long periods, it is uh, 3D. The limitations of this analysis is that there's no a statistical framework, but the the dimensionality results can be grouped into bands of groups of periods. 
and the dimensionality maps uh, provide information on regions with preferred orientations and to identify which areas are more or less uh, complex. For instance, this is the map that we obtained from the study of the diabetics data set. We can see um, a lot of uh, different dimensionality uh, results from short periods to more long periods. But in general, we can see that in the northern and western part, which were affected by less geological processes, the, the Iberian and the external zones of, the, of this chain, have more simpler uh, uh, dimensionality, whereas in the internal part, which is in the southern eastern part, because they uh, had um, geologically different superposition of uh, of the formations, the strike directions and the dimensionality is much more complex. Next, I'm gonna talk about the phase tensor, which was defined by Caldwell et al in 2004. This is a real tensor that is uh, defined as the product of the inverse of the real part of the impedance tensor, multiplying the imaginary part of the um, yeah, the, of, the, of the impedance tensor is what we will do with a single component to calculate the phase, but we do for the full tensor. And the property of this tensor is that it is unaffected by galvanic distortion. It can be proved mathematically that if the, both parts are affected, the, when you divide them, the distortion disappears, which is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time, because doesn't um, doesn't modify the, the regional structure, but you don't get information of the of this distortion. Mathematically, it can also be decomposed in well, in the uh, in this form and uh, represented through a ellipse. In this ellipse, this ellipse, if the two maximum and minimum axes are equal, it means that we have a 1D case. However, if we have a 2D case with the same phases at T and Tm, they are also uh, the same representation, and the ellipse will convert into a, a circle. If it is 2D, it's important to look at the value of beta, which is the difference between uh, the, the place where we have the direction of the maximum or the minimum axis and the alpha angle. So if it's zero, then alpha will be the strike direction. And finally, if it's 3D, uh, this beta value will be different than zero. And again, we have well here all these three representations that I described. And uh, apart from Calgul et al, we can refer to Murkam, Guiver et al, and Booker 2013 with different discussions and analysis of the different parameters of the phase tensor. Uh, taking again that first example, I'm gonna go back to the same periods that we have analyzed before. For site one, which we say that with Waldim, we saw that it was 1D, the phase tensor, the, it shows the ellipse is a circle and uh, it agrees with the 1D description. For site two, which uh, again Waldim gave us a 2D a structure, we represent the two phase tensor ellipses. At 100 seconds, beta is zero, the strike is 40 degrees, it corresponds to a 2D structure. But at 1,000 seconds, uh, here we have to be careful because it looks like 1D, but because T and because the T and TM faces are equal. For site three, which the Waldim gave us a distortion over 2D or over 1D or 2D, at 100 seconds we went we get the right uh, strike angle, 
but we have no information if there is distortion or not. That's fine because the phase tensor is not supposed to, to identify that. And at 1000 and second, however, um, we can think that it's a 1D. But this was also for, for uh, the welding. And for the 3D case, yes, here we have to be careful. The, the phase tensor ellipse um, has a, a, a specific direction, in this case of 25 degrees. Beta is minus two degrees. We might think that this is a small, but this is uh, large. So we have to be very careful with the value of the threshold because this, as we showed, should correspond to a 3D structure. But with this small value, we might think, no, it's, it's 2D, but it's, uh, it's not. So again, be careful with the threshold of beta. Um, taking again, the example that I show you from the diabetics data set, here I plotted I, in this table the results of the wall analysis, which showed 2D at short periods, 3D over 2D at middle periods, and 3D at long periods. And here I plotted the phase tensor ellipses, and it's, uh, it totally agrees as, as we should expect. And uh, here is important to see that as the, as the periods increases, the value of the skew, which is the, the beta angle, uh, is higher. And here I also plotted the, the error, the, the, beta, the beta angle with its errors, which also is important that uh, to take into account the the, the error estimation of these parameters. So now, uh, next, I'm going to talk about decomposition methods. For a historical perspective, there's a very detailed um, summary at the book of Chavan Jones. In, and I'll just mention the first one could be the one from Larsen, which detected or identify the distortion of our, of our 1D. And then based on Grumman Bailey, um, we can the over 2D, there's the approach of Mangis and Jones, the state code, which I'm going to talk about next. And over 3D, there are some approaches like the one from Ledo et al. and Garcia and Jones in 2002. So the 3D over 2D Grumman Bailey decomposition, what assumes is that our regional structure is 2D, it's affected by distortion and has been rotated. So we have what we have measured at eight uh, parameters. We, these are the data that we know. But if we want to recover the, the strike, the distortion parameters and the regional, we have nine unknowns. As we said, if we have the, if it's 2D, we have this scale factor that we cannot um, properly uh, identify. So we are left with um, the strike, two distortion parameters, and the four uh, regional components, which leaves us with, with seven unknowns. So for a single frequency, the problem will be solved by fitting a data to a seven parameter uh, model. The strike code from Magnus and Jones, what it does is the Grumman Bailey decomposition of the magnetotelluric tensor data supported by statistical methods, which is to fit the data to a 3D over 2D model. It can be performed for single sites, single frequencies, or grouped frequencies, and it allows to fix or not some of the model parameters. Uh, it can, if we use it for multi-site, multi-frequency, what we do in the if in the first case, if we have one site with n frequencies, the problem is to fit uh, seven parameters to, in this case 
eight times n, the number of frequencies data, because we have the same as strike and distortion parameters for all the, all the frequencies. So we are left with eight times n data um, and three, three, which are, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> these three, uh, the strike and the distortion components times n frequencies unknowns. If we have m sides, now the difference is that the only thing that these sides share are the a strike direction, we can have different distortion at each side. And again, when trying to fit the same distortion parameters to all the frequencies. So here, I'm not going to read this, <laughs> have all this data and uh, this number of unknowns. In any case, it's a overdetermined problem. We have more data than unknowns. And it's a question of fitting, finding the best fit for this uh, for these unknowns. So um, I will say that this is a tool to investigate if a data set or a subset can be decomposed as 2D in base of 2D modeling or to obtain a priori information for a 3D inversion. It cannot be used as a black box. It's recommended to perform in steps to fully understand the, the data set. And it is very important to quantify the RMS or the misfit. So how well does my data fit this 3D over two model assumption? As an example, I take again the, the same site from the diabetics, which uh, from the wall analysis gave us 2D, 3D over 2D and 3D. And I did different analysis of the uh, strike. The first one was leaving all the parameters free and group in different bands of periods. And I obtained different strikes and different um, distortion parameters. The ones that are uh, with gray background means that the misfits are very large. The second analysis was to leave all the parameters free and do all the periods at the same time. So we obtain a single strike and a single value of the twist and the shear, but the misfits were not very good. And the last analysis was done in two period bands or three in this case. For the short periods, I leave non-distortion, which is what I expected from the wall analysis. So we it fitted, no problem. And for the short, longest periods, if I take um, one single band with distortion, it didn't fit properly, only if I separate it into uh, these two uh, groups, which again, we haven't discovered anything, but we can see how um, this 2D case is coincident with the wall analysis and this 3D over 2D is consistent with the 3D over 2D results. So uh, we're almost at the end of this tour. <laughs> now I would like to extend it to uh, an anisotropic Earth, which uh, well, the, what happens now is that our electrical conductivity is not a, a scalar and it depends on the orientation in which it has been uh, measured. Mathematically represent as a matrix uh, which is symmetric and positive definite and it's possible to diagonalize it through the Euler angle rotations. Um, how does the anisotropy affect the magnetotelluric responses? <laughs> I summarize it very, very summarized. <laughs> In 1D, what we have is the, that the impedance tensor has different components in the of diagonals, same components in the diagonalized diagonals, but with different signs, and is not necessarily diagonalizable. <laughs> so it's not always possible to find a direction in which the matrix becomes of diagonal. 
a characteristic though that will give us the main hint is that the tipper is zero, even if we have this type of impedance tensor. So this apparent inconsistency is one first hint about the presence of an isotropy. And the other is that all the sites will have the same responses, even if it's uh, looking like a 2D. So that could be a first hint. For 2D, this can be, um, if we are lucky and we can, the anisotropy is in our, the directions of measurements, we can have a specific pattern, which we, the matrix, the impedance tensor can be of diagonal and the tipper can be um, apparently consistent with it. But if we cannot decouple this equation, it will look like 3D. If an isotropy, effect, an isotropy affects 3D structures, then of course, again, we'll have the general solution. So some tests that I did uh, using the code of Peck and Berner, um, which solves the direct problem for 1D and 2D structure, is what, how is the dimensionality for one anisotropic an layer? Uh, the wall dimensionality gives us 1D at the first layer because it's the one without an isotropy. But once we have an anisotropic layer, uh, the dimensionality is 2D. And the strike direction is actually the direction of the anisotropy. In the, um, the phase tensor, give us responses that could look like 2D. So both are uh, give us the, the same information. But again, what can give us more, the most important hint is that the tipper is zero or that the fact that the same responses are, uh, we have the same responses at all the sites. If we have two anisotropic layers, this gets more funny as, um, here I put the wall dim results. We have 1D for the layer without an isotropy, then 2D for the first layer of an isotropy. But once we get the second layer, we have a mix of 3D, uh, 3D dimensionality and then 2D again. The phase tensor results, which give us similar results, which um, looks uh, like 2D, but the beta, the skew, is uh, high at middle periods, which will be consistent with these uh, 3D cases. And if we have a 2D model with an, an isotropic layer, like the, this model here with the two, uh, two isotropic uh, bodies, but then there's an isotropic layer. The, we have 2D cases, well, first 1D cases before we find the, this layer. Then we have 2D with different strike directions from the real and imaginary parts, which if it was 2D isotropic, they will be the same. And then the induction arrows that are not perpendicular to the strike directions. And also we find uh, 3D cases. So and um, then I will name other st different uh, studies that have been done with anisotropy using the tools that I will that I have been talking about. The first will be the one from Hayes et al of anisotropy and phase splits in magnetotellurics, which uh, uses the phase tensor with an isotropic structure. Marty et al, 2010, in which we extended the Waldim criteria for an isotropic structure and relating to the decomposition, Jones, 2012, uh, developed uh, the composition for 3D over a 1D anisotropic uh, Earth. And um, I will refer to Marty 2014, the review on anisotropy for more uh, extended information on this. So, summing up, empty response analysis is a powerful tool 
to assess the data dimensionality and have a first glance at the structures below before modeling. Here we have reviewed some of the most used tools, the strike, the wall dim, and the phase tensor. They are all valid and complementary, but have to be taken with caution. And error data must be included in all the analysis. So if we don't want to get this, that from the empty data, we magically get the, the model rabbit, <laughs> we have to do a proper response analysis with the corrections and rotations, choose the inversion strategy and a priori information to put that in your modeling or inversion code that can be 1D, 2D or 3D, and we'll get uh, models that have a, a meaning and a, a, a plausible a geological interpretation. So thank you very much for your attention. I would like to special thanks Alan, Kate, Max and Stephen for inviting me to do this seminar and particularly Alan who provided me some of his materials from his course and the colleagues at UBE who helped me, to, helped me to improve this seminar, Pilar, Alex, Juanjo, Perla and Gemma. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna, on behalf of all the up to 70 attendees and <laughs> I'd like to really thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation and uh, I particularly like from the outset your point that people should be looking at data before they shovel them into um, 3D inversion codes, that, that's super important. I think these are, uh, I'm seeing more and more that people are collecting data, they're not looking at them and they're just throwing them into 3D codes and then worrying why they get strange features in the model. So th this step is, is super important. Um, yeah, everyone can now please uh, put questions in. You've got, you've got your first one from Zakaria Bukhava, and I'm going to read the questions out so they get, they get into the recording. Thank you for your talk. Please, on what basis you are choosing the threshold for the phase tensor analysis? Yeah, this will be for the for the skew for the beta. Um, is looking at the basically if you get a two D structure, but then you have very big errors in the strike. That can be your your choice. Maybe the 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 angle was too too low. In experience as we saw in this synthetic example, two degrees is already a very large uh, beta angle. And in, I think is it in the, the empty pi phase tensor, above two degrees is where they, the, the beta has a, a different color than, than white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, surely it's a function of, of your uh, precision of the data, the accuracy of the data. You know that the more precise the data are, then the threshold will be different from very, very poor quality data. Okay, the next question is from Geisa Frank. Thanks for this very comprehensive talk. Concerning the phase tensor ellipses, assuming 2D, can we conclude anything from the width of the ellipse, i.e. the ratio of phi max and phi oh. min? <laughs> mm, I think, yeah, we missed the, the information of the other side of the tensor because you can have a circle and be 2D just because at that frequency, the faces are the same. Yeah, I don't know if that's clear. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's the, the width, uh, how elongated an ellipse is, is surely a measure of the strength the of the dimensionality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, we have but, a question Sorry, from... but Jez, again, if you have very 
um, if the ellipse is uh, <laughs> elongated with uh, short, small values of beta, then you can be sure that it's 2D. But if it's a circle, you can have both things, that it's 1D or that it's 2D with the same faces. Well, if I may sort of interject, I understand this question that, okay, you assume you know it's 2D, and then the question becomes, yeah, you have this very elongated ellipse versus a, uh, let's say, slightly elongated ellipse. And at least in my experience, it's also, um, if you assume 2D, uh, a function of the conductivity contrast, because it's basically the phase difference that you're looking at, and that becomes larger if you're either closer to a, a strong conductivity contrast or you have um, a strong conduct or a conductivity contrast and you change that contrast, then it also changes the ellipticity of your phase tensor. I think Wiebke Heise in her 2006 paper plotted some of that. Yeah, yeah, and that's. Um... The well, she, the phase splits in that case is more related to the change in the to the contacts than to the anisotropy uh, itself. Okay, next question is from Ashok Gupta. Ma'am, can we distinguish between 1D anisotropic and 2D structures, or are they the same? Mm. The tensor can be the same, but then the tipper is the one that can give you the, the hint. Mm. Because in 2D, you can diagonalize it, but in 1D and isotropic, uh, not in general, mm. unless it's only one, one layer. Also, if it's 1D and isotropic, you will get uh, a tipper, but all the responses will be the same at the, will be the same at all the sides. So that's like a contradiction, that will be a contradiction in an isotropic uh, earth. Yeah, I think that's, a, you know, I'm really glad you, you spoke uh, about anisotropy, Anna, because I really think that, that in the MT game is the, ne is the the next frontier, we really need to handle that because anisotropy is far more prevalent in the earth than, than we have been modeling it at. So Makoya Didas, very good presentation, Anna. My question is how do you handle the inversion of the stations with varying dimensionality with depth? <laughs> <laughs> then you have to use the highest, the highest one, the 3D, 3D. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and one thing that I, as I was doing this uh, seminar, I well, I was debating myself also between how can I have this uh, 2D, then 3D over 2D, and then 3D, and I have well, lots of synthetic examples in which this happens. The, depending on the frequency, you you see the more or less uh, complexity because you're averaging bigger bigger or uh, volumes. I think the reality is that it's, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, Anna, it's, it's, the Earth is 3D and it's only a question of whether we're resolving that. So it's, it's a question of the errors in the data. If our errors are very big, then the Earth looks like a, a half space. And as our, as our data gets more and more accurate, we see the dimensionality of the Earth more and more accurately. And so it may be possible that some parts of your data set, the high frequencies, you can validly invert in 1D or 2D. But then once you get into uh, more complex structures, you've no choice but to go to 3D. Now, Eric Rhodes uh, poses a really, really interesting question. And uh, he says, thank you for your presentation. Do you have a strategy recommendations for inverting 3D data where you suspect anisotropy? E.g., do you discard stations with anisotropy, remove the affected components, use high errors, etc.? 
Well, um, I have, well, inverting data with an isotropy, I don't have much experience. I have analyzed a lot of data, but then here I stayed here. What we can do in, in 2D, but I guess it can be extended also to 3D, is to start with uh, macro anisotropy, because also 3D inversion for anisotropy, there's not many codes that are available, especially if it's not in the in the directions of the of the mesh of the measuring directions. So I would start with modeling it as macro anisotropy, and <laughs> but cannot give you much. Much, uh, much recommendations because inverting data with an isotropy, I don't have many, many experience. Mm. Only identifying it. <laughs> yeah, I think that really is the next, next point for some sort of research is to, is just like uh, Juanjo Ledo and, and uh, others um, looked at 2D inversion of 3D data. I think the next step is looking at 3D isotropic inversion of, of anisotropic huh. Earth and just see how wrong we can be. So Burak Cherokose says, uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Can you tell us why in Groom Bailey they assume the regional structures as 2D? Well, well, is, is the approach that we can identify because if it's if it's 3D, there's well, then we need to do other strategies. We cannot recover the galvanic distortion just from the from the impedance tensor. We need to look, for instance, the approach from I think it was Ledo, Ledo et al that took the first periods, corrected from, from there, which was 2D, and then applied that to the structures below, which were uh, 3D. Yeah, and in grooming mm -hmm. Bailey, if it is 1D, you can recover that too, but uh, you'll get, you won't get a, a well-defined strike direction. Okay, it, if that's all the questions from everybody then, I'd like to thank Anna one more time and on behalf of all the 70 people who, who watch you, Anna, I'd, I, I'll just thank you again and I'll, I'll get the screen back just to remind people uh, that um, next week's seminar is uh, Alireza Malamia and uh, he will be speaking at uh, the same time um, next week. And so thank you all for attending. Um, have, a, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Uh, stay safe, take care, and okay. bye for now. Yeah, thank bye, you Anna. all. Thank you. <laughs> bye.